So I think that's an area, you know, as we become more environmentally conscious, as we think about sustainability in our systems, it's it's something we have to give it credit and value for and think about how we continue um, um, to get that to get that out of there. And, you know, I wanted to make one comment. We've talked a lot about the beneficial aspects of fiber, and I certainly believe those. I certainly think there's a way that we can um, uh, utif- utilize it to capitalize on those benefits, and it's a continuing growing science around that. But we have to keep in the back of our mind that there are anti-nutritive effects that are associated with it. You know, it's not... It's not a silver bullet by any means. It's a it's a tool, or it's a way that we can, you know, potentially um, utilize ingredients differently. Uh, but it certainly can reduce the nutrient digestibility. Swallow it. All right, welcome to our latest edition of Swine It. Uh, I'm Jerry Purvis, your host. And today we have Dr. Amy Petrie. Uh, she is an assistant professor at the University of Missouri. And I uh, want to welcome you today, uh, Dr. Petrie, to our, to our uh, podcast. Thank you so much. Yep. You know, we always, uh, fiber is something, uh, you've done a lot of work with fiber. And uh, I think it's uh, it's going to be interesting to our viewers to, to learn a little bit more about it, maybe learn some things they didn't know and, and how some misconceptions I think that people have with fiber. Uh, and I, I'll start out saying you're preaching to the choir. Uh, I've, I've been using fiber in diets, uh, particularly the last three years, looking at sales. And, uh, and so, uh, you don't have to do much convincing. I've seen it out in the field, but uh, it's good to, you know, the work that you're doing and, and kind of validates things and, and move forward. So I guess, you know, just first, let's just tell us a little bit about yourself. To start with. Yeah, sure. So, uh, like you mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Missouri. I just started here in May. Um, we're really excited to be here. So uh, my uh, addition to the department has been um, super exciting. It's been a while since they've had a swine nutritionist. So we're uh, we're excited to bring more of that work back to this university and to be back in the Midwest. Um, prior to being here, I did two years on faculty at Texas Tech University um, and then worked mostly in fiber, as you mentioned, with sows, and then also some work in soybean meal, um, and then a little bit on some more physiology-based uh, work in sows. And then prior to that, I did my PhD at Iowa State University and uh, worked with John Patience there. And so that's a little bit about my background here at Mizzou. We've got a, a, a team of um, graduate and undergraduate researchers. I have four graduate students and five undergraduate researchers um, that work with me. And our research themes are really around fiber and energy and how we can improve the utilization of fiber in animals. Uh, We do a lot of work in sows and how we can support that sow from a nutrition perspective related um, to states of homeoresis. So when she's gestating and when she's farrowing and uh, even lactation. And we do a lot of that work in fiber. And then third, we look at um, these bioactive molecules or basically parts of feed um, that can influence the physiology of an animal, um, but may not necessarily be a, a nutrient. And so that's kind of the scope of the work that we're doing here. An animal nutrition technology company offering innovative products and new applications for the swine industry. The combination of AB Vista enzymes, technical services, and nutrition expertise provides the industry with new opportunities to further improve production efficiencies. Fiber is receiving renewed interest due to its influence on the microbiome, and AB Vista has brought together research experts to discuss the industry's knowledge of fiber functionality and to introduce a stimbiotic targeted to improve fiber digestion. To request access, contact NAM at abvista.com. That's N-A-M at abvista.com. Very good. You know, it sounds like you've uh, you've had a good path and, and a lot of good mentors, Dr. Doc, Patients, uh, obviously, a, you know, a heavy hitter in, in our industry as well. You know, uh, I guess as nutritious, we understand fiber, but there may be some, some viewers out there that producers or, or vets that really done, don't understand fiber. Can you kind of just tell us a little something, uh, you know, define fiber and, and how that uh, is a nutrient in our diets today? 
Sure. So Fiverr is a, a really complex entity and depending on who you talk to, it has different definitions. And that's um, part of what makes me so excited to work with it because it, um, it, it has different meanings to different people. So the USDA uh, or not, the FDA defines fiber as um, uh, the components of plant cell walls that are intrinsic or intact um, that are um, basically undigestible, but then also confer a health benefit um, to whoever consumes them. And so that's really a human nutrition um, definition for dietary fiber. We can think of fiber really in, in animal nutrition as carbohydrates that you and I and other mammals cannot digest and that we rely on our microbiome um, to ferment. Um, they're largely non-starch polysaccharides, but there can be other fibrous components as well. Um, and they're part of the plant cell wall that um, we simply cannot utilize, but our microbes can, and that's a really important relationship that can have beneficial aspects. Very good. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned uh, uh, kind of uh, as nutritionists, uh, fiber has been kind of an enemy, you know, in the past. As we started, when you think about, you know, energy, it, it loots your energy and your diets. Uh, we don't have the enzymes, as you mentioned, you know, digest. So, uh, we don't have, we don't get the energy. Also, it dilutes, it kind of uh, impacts other nutrients, you know, the digestibility and availability. So uh, I think as nutritionists, we've always kind of run from fiber and try and tried to, uh, you know, manage that part of it in our diets. So what do you think, uh, you know, as, as we move forward, what are some of the reasons why we, why we need to look more into fiber and what are some of the, what are some of the uh, things that we can get from fiber that are, that are maybe positive in animal? Yeah, so it's a really good point that you make, Jerry, because oftentimes you look in the literature and think about, you know, fiber has been often called the anti-nutrient, something that dilutes the digestibility of other nutrients and how do we utilize it? And then, you know, with the DDGs boom around 2008, we got a lot more fiber in diets. And so how do we utilize this thing that is, um, diluting basically energy, as you said, in our dietary components. And, you know, I try to look at fiber from a bunch of different lenses. The, the anti-nutrient part is there. It's something we can't escape. It certainly can dilute energy. It can have an influence on digestibility. It increases rate of passage. It alters um, how the, the heat increment it offers, um, alters digest, uh, digestive function. And so there are a host of things that we have to deal with around fiber, particularly relates to feed efficiency. And that's certain part of what our group is doing. And I think as there is a lot of area of research as we, you know, try to be more sustainable, as there's more fibrous products that we likely might have to use moving forward. And, you know, as we're trying to get more calories out of our feedstuffs is how do we mitigate those anti-nutritive effects? So I think that's one area that I look at fiber. The other aspect of fiber is that you know, humans have a fiber requirement. You and I should eat 35 grams of fiber every day. And if you ask a human nutritionist, um, you know, they'll, it's often think of it as the forgotten nutrient or a nutrient that's of um, great concern to human longevity. And we don't really see that when we think about pig nutrition because so much of our work is terminal. But when we think about the sow where we're trying to get longevity out of her and we think about the symbiosis with her microbiome and an animal that's feed restricted where fiber can might play a role to satiety and reducing uh, behaviors with being feed restriction, feed restricted and bulking, I think it has a lot of positive aspects. And even on the terminal side, you know, the health of those animals, there's a fiber play there. You know, the, our interaction with our microbiome certainly contributes to the health of our animal um, and to the health of us. I think today, more than ever, we notice that we're not just mammals. We're mammals with a bunch of bugs inside of us. And so, you know, how we feed those bugs is important from a longevity perspective for the sow and then also the health of a weaned pig. And so I think there's a lot of areas where fiber plays a role. We just may never have looked at it from that perspective um, until until we were maybe challenged to do so in an era of, you know, less antibiotic usage or increased mortality, where we have to think out of it from a little different perspective. Yeah, that's a good point. The humans, uh, we all know, you know, doctors tell you, all you read, we need to eat more fiber. And fiber has, you know, cholesterol, reducing our cholesterol and, and diabetes. It's, it's a very good, uh, it's something that we need to do. And 
we don't think about that on the south side. Make think you made good points there. Uh, where we're facing today, you know, uh, increasing sow mortality year after year. We're, we're losing animals, and, uh, and so we, we've got to figure out some way that we can do that without antibiotics. You know, and you, you go on the next. I think that's a good topic. You know, the buzzword today is gut health. You know, all products we're trying to improve gut health, health, and we know how that improves the whole health. You know, of that animal and the immune system is right there with the gut. So, so what are you know going into gut? How exactly does fiber uh, improve that gut health? Yeah, so it's 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 certain fiber types, and certainly it's um, depends on how the fiber is provided in the diet. There are there are instances where maybe actually is negative to gut health, but a lot of the ways it's beneficial is um, fiber when fermented um, produces a variety of short chain fatty acids and other um, uh, microbial metabolites that then influence um, cell signaling within the gut. There's a lot of pathways um, that mediate inflammation, the immune system's response. It also um, can has a huge impact on modulating how microbial communities are established, how their metabolism is established, um, cooperative metabolism of microbes within the gut. And, you know, when we think about fiber as their main feedstuff, when we reduce fiber in diets or we alter the feedstuffs that are entering the large intestine, um, we change the dynamics of the microbiome. And when we change the dynamics of the microbiome, we change the metabolites that are produced. And then we change what is then available to the gut, um, the gut itself, you know, what those uh, cells are uptaking, what those influence of those cells are from an inflammation perspective. And then, you know, that can have a host of gut leakiness um, and other gut health um, type parameters that it can influence. And, you know, I think of fiber as a relationship to gut health is there are instances, yes, where it has an influence on improving gut health, but I think it's a, a integral part of maintaining gut function and physiology. So thinking, taking the health side of it away, if let's assume just in a normal animal where there's no health challenge or no associated health response in the gut, we just think of a normal animal. The fiber has a very beneficial component to gut physiology and function. You know, it improves constipation. If we think about it from a, a sow and constipation in an animal causes gut dysbiosis as it relates to the microbiome. And if we, we provide ample amounts of fiber in the right type, um, in the right construct that reduces protein fermentation, that can then influence overall gut health or gut function, particularly in a young animal. And so there's lots of, I think, different perspectives in the way to, to look at it. Um, but I think it's an integral part of physiology and function. That's one of um, the areas of research that our lab is really ha uh, honing in on. My PhD student, Hannah Miller, is doing a big project right now where we're trying to understand particularly the fiber sources that we feed in the U.S. today, predominantly those that come from corn, how does that affect the function and the physiology of the gut? And what is an optimum fiber, fiber level? We don't think of having a fiber requirement because we feed so much of it. Um, but, you know, in an era where we're maybe trying to be more precise in how we feed animals, what's an optimum fiber requirement or what causes an optimum symbiosis in the microbiome with gut physiology. And so that's some of the work that we're doing is trying to trying to figure out in the context of pork production, what where can we upside the beneficial aspects of fiber? You know, you made good points there. Uh, fiber, uh, I guess maybe we should stop there and see, you know, what uh, all fiber is not the same. You know, you know predominantly in, in the U.S., we got DDGs, you know, wheat mids, soy hulls. So how do you, as you, as you uh, tread through all these fiber sources, how do we identify those sources and, and what makes those sources, characteristics of fiber sources, uh, more or less beneficial in our diets today for sales? Yeah, that's a, it's a complex question, Jerry, because when you think about analyzing fiber, there's so many ways to do it and it, it, it only tells you so much of the story. So unlike, let's say, like an amino acid, you measure arginine or you measure lysine in a diet, you're measuring directly that amino acid. And fiber, it's an indirect measurement. It's a chemical measurement because we can't directly, consistently direct measure all the different types of fiber. So there's so many types of 
non-starch polysaccharides and cellulose and lignin. And then you have arabinoxylans and beta-glucans and beta-manins and there's um, uh, pectins and remlogractans. There's all these different fiber types that compose dietary fiber. But the way that we measure fiber, it has to be defined by the chemical measurement that we give it. And so historically, um, we were measuring in animal nutrition crude fiber. It was part of the weaned system for uh, proximate analysis. It was, a, you know, we boil it in an acid and a base and we look at the fiber portion. And, you know, I think back to one of my, my mentors and he, he made a statement, you know, he's published it now. And when I was doing my PhD, he said, you know, crude fiber is the Achilles heel when it comes to fiber uh, understanding because it underestimates the amount of fiber in most ingredients by 60%. And so there's, you know, we've done a pretty good job as an industry, you know, if I'd say probably past 12, 15 years moving away from crude fiber, it's not something that has as much value to understanding fiber because we're only getting a small glimpse of some of the insoluble fibers that are there, some of the fibers in the complex entity of the plant. So from there, we've moved on to the detergent fiber system, the Van Soest fiber system for analyzing fiber, NDF and ADF, neutral detergent, acid detergent fiber. And those give us a better insight on uh, in, insight on what fiber types are there as it relates to hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin. But those are all insoluble fibers, and it underestimates fiber in some aspects related to soluble fiber, and it can't be corrected for non-protein nitrogen and ash, so it actually overestimates insoluble fiber portions that are there. And so when you take those two things into account, it's not necessarily the most precise measurement but for the vast amount of fibrous co-products and cereal grains, it gives us a fairly good insight to the fiber content of those ingredients. The next step, which there's been a lot of push towards, um, but I don't know if necessarily adoption is, is there or if it's coming because of its expense, is the total dietary fiber system, where we can separate them into insoluble and soluble fiber components. And that's by far our most um, precise measurement for fiber of to date. Um, it's in fact what human nutrition uses. It's what's on the fiber label, depending on what AOAC method you're using. And for me, it gives us the most insight into what fiber types are there. And so if we think about corn, corn DDGs, wheat mints, you know, we're dealing a lot of insoluble fiber. But when you look at things like soy holes and sugar beet pulp and bakery and other um, feedstuffs, we have more soluble fiber components in there. And so if we don't look at TDF values uh, or soluble and insoluble dietary fibers, we don't get a good understanding of the, the fiber sources that are there. Oats are in that same realm. Um, if you're dealing with some variety of, you know, different grains and co-products, pea holes, um, any citrus pulp, you know, in certain unique areas. I mean, we don't know any of the fiber there unless we do TDF. We get that insoluble and insoluble portion. The issue with that is, and at least it's something that I'm, I'm trying to encourage that when we think about fiber is insoluble and soluble, they're exactly like they sound. They're their solubility in water. And so it's a chemical measurement. And so those chemical measurements don't always translate to a physiological aspect of that fiber. And so insoluble fibers, for the most part, are unfermentable or poorly fermented. But there are aspects of insoluble fiber that can be fermented. And there are sources of insoluble fiber that are actually quite fermentable. Pea holes is one of them. A lot of the legume holes are more fermentable um, than many of the um, corn coat products. And they have fairly similar levels of insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber, on the other hand, is largely fermentable for the most case. But different soluble fibers act differently in the gut. Some make these viscous gels that reduce rate of passage, that they alter digestive transit time, they offer hunger signaling. Some don't create viscous gels. Um, some of the soluble fiber actually binds to um, calcium in different cations. And so when we think about fiber and its different complexities, I'm trying to think about it more from a, how is it influencing physiology? What is its ferm fermentability? What's its influence on fermentation? What's its influence on rate of passage? Its influence on viscosity, uh, water holding capacities, all these different measures that we can look at to get a better understanding on what it's actually doing to the digestion inside the gut. That was a very long answer for your question. <laughs> well, no, yeah, and I think you made a good, uh, 
it was good there. I think what I'm hearing there is, is soluble, insoluble. Yeah, those are two different components that have different uh, physiological impacts in, in the animal. Could you take a minute, kind of differentiate, you know, soluble and insoluble? What are some of the, you know, just in a layman's term, what are some of the, the benefits if, if we have this what insoluble fiber might have in a, in a sow, we're just taking a gestating sow or lactating sow versus uh, having a soluble, you know, having a soluble, soluble component of fiber. What, what are some of the things that, that the animal benefits having with each of those uh, types of uh, character, fiber characteristics? Sure. So with the insoluble fiber sources, and these are, I mean, the vast, you're getting most of that from corn, a little bit from soy, um, particularly and wheat and wheat mids um, and some soy holes. Those are, you know, those are your big sources of insoluble fiber. That insoluble fiber uh, in the gut has multi different aspects. You know, largely it has a water holding capacity, so not water binding. It, it holds water in the pores of the fiber structure. What that does in a sow is it increases laxation. It increases her um, rate of passage, um, in which she then passes nutrients uh, a little bit quicker. So that can have some downside. That's often a negative connotation. But when we think about it, relationship to a sow who has a fairly long digestive tract, fairly high capacity um, for digestion, it helps improve transit time. And when we think about a sow that's getting close to farrowing, kind of in that transition period, once you've loaded her, you know, having a sow that has increased laxation generally puts less stress on the reproductive bodies as it relates to farrowing. And so improving constipation is one of the aspects, it has a bulking aspect to it, which can help improve satiety. There's really good literature that shows that certain insoluble fiber sources can help um, reduce behaviors associated with being feed restricted. She's going to feel fuller longer. Um, she's going to likely have less insulin resistance because of um, the rate of passage changes and in some interplay with gut hormones, and that can have an influence on her farrowing capabilities. It can have ins influences on how she utilizes energy during farrowing. And so that interplay with a lot of in with insulin um, is an important aspect of insoluble fiber. It also um, can improve its relationship to the microbiome because some of that insoluble fiber is fermented. Um, there are microbes beneficial in a sense, and I put that in quotation marks because I, I'm, I'm not convinced we know quite what are the beneficial and which are the bad bugs in the gut, um, but it certainly can improve microbial metabolism in a way um, that can help increase symbiosis between her and her physiology. And so adding fiber into that helps with that. It can also mitigate some of the pathogenic effects of certain microbes because it can help increase that rate of transit time. And so there's less ability for those microbes to elicit their pathogenic mechanisms. And so that's another, you know, upside to insoluble fiber. And in fact, the sow in general, because of her increase in size, because of her increased digestive capacity, she often gets more out of that insoluble fiber relative to like a finishing pig, because in general, she has a slower transit time. And so she has a larger GI tract, so she can often get more calories, it seems like, out of that insoluble fiber source. On the flip side, soluble fiber sources, and so, you know, soy holes has some soluble fiber, soybean meal has some soluble fiber in it, sugar beet pulp has another source of soluble fiber, we can even use enzymes to create some soluble fiber fractions from insoluble fiber, um, and there are other sources, they're just not as available here in the U.S., we think about, you know, some others in uh, European countries, potato residue, resistant starch, um, pectin based residues, sunflower meal, like there are a bunch of other soluble fiber sources, you know, adding in some soluble fiber into the diet improves fermentation. Um, it improves the production of these short chain fatty acids and, metab and, and microbial metabolites that increase um, gut function, you know, increases a butyrogenic effect, butyrate we think of as a short chain fatty acid in the gut that has a lot of beneficial effects. It's not the only one acetate does too. Um, but it gets more energy out of it. Those short chain fatty acids then mediate a, a reduction in inflammation. And we showed that. So there's some work we've done in our lab. Um, Thomas Chrome's master work, um, it's uh, and currently being published. It's shown that, you know, with soluble and insoluble fiber sources, we alter um, 
basically the interaction of cytokines in that late gestating sow. We probably have less inflammatory pressures. The other thing that it does, and I don't think we often think about it, but there's it's it's been published out of Europe quite a bit, is feeding fibrous diets to sows outside of the welfare component increases her digestive capacity and feed intake capacity during lactation. And we think about particularly that, you know, first parity sow or the guilt that's go- coming sow, kind of that first week post lactation, you know, if we can increase her feed intake, I think that has huge advantages for her litter and huge advantages for her reproductive performance. And the bulking and stretching capacities of insoluble fiber in conjunction with the fermentation beneficial aspects of soluble fiber can, you know, have beneficial effects on her feed intake. And I think that's an area where we maybe underestimate the value of fiber when it comes to sows. Yeah, that's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I have to give a shout out uh, Dr. Pete uh, Wilcox, which is uh, at AB Vista. He, he has, he's European. He, he has a lot. Of, they, they have more experience with fiber, and he got me involved in, in looking at this. And uh, and started, you know, feeding, and, and almost invariably we saw an increase in our, our lactation intake, even with younger parity animals. So uh, I think that that's a good point there. And, and I guess what you're saying, you're in, you got insoluble uh Portion maybe helps with that constipation, which is huge. You know, if you can get that, uh, you want to get that sow, uh, defecate one time, you know, and, and clear out for prior to, to that farrowing episode. And uh, and then the soluble portion too, just the satiety impact. As we're moving more into group housing, it seems like it's even more important that we have, and we're feeding less feed to these animals and they're not satisfied. So, you know, we kind of, how does that? How does that? Uh, that fiber, uh, in in fact, uh, help with satiety. You know, it, it, it's making that out. So it's it's multi dynamic. Um, one of the interesting things about fiber, particularly if we can, um, you know, with soluble fibers, if we can slow down rate of passage, she'll have more gut fill, and that gut fill um, tends to increase, um, decrease hunger hormones, increases satiety hormones in the animal. And when we increase satiety hormones, we get basically feedback to the pituitary that reduces behaviors related to, um, related to hunger. It also, because of the gut filling aspect of it, um, with that stretch on the gastrointestinal tract, there are chemosensors there, um, that actually, because of the feed particles that are there can increase, um, satiety hormones as well. One of the interesting thing facts about feeding, you know, more fiber to sows, um, there's some work that the late Peter Thiel has done related to, to hunger hormones is that we get more of a, what we call the ileal break, the P, this PYY hormone that kind of reduces small intestine transit. And when we reduce that small intestine, um, intestine transit of digesta, we get a little bit more fill in the stomach and then it increases satiety. Uh, lower later on. The same thing with that is particular soluble fiber sources, because we get this slowing down of um, rate of passage, particularly related to farrowing. You know, when the sow's in this dynamic homeoretic state, uh, right close to farrowing, you know, she's you know going through the endurance race of um, parturition. You know, we get some hypoxia to the gut. We reduce less resources there because we're moving our energetic resources elsewhere, which makes sense from a physiological standpoint. But the issue with that is, is that the gut is the one providing energy for the other resources. And when we think about fiber relative to energy responses, you know, really starchy feeds, just like what you and, you know, we think about you and I and how we process diets, you know, we eat a sugary meal, you get this huge glucose um, spike. And then a couple hours later, um, you get a glucose crash. Well, the sow is inevitably doing that because of this dynamic of her physiology. And if we feed her one time a day or you know, maybe she's not, she's farrowing, you know, far away from her last meal, then she doesn't have this ready available glucose. The interesting thing about fiber, because of its glycemic response, we get a steady state of short chain fatty acid release. And the slower we can reduce that rate of passage, the more fiber that's there to be fermented, um, we can increase the readily available energy sources um, to her during farrowing, which then could potentially reduce her time, uh, her farrowing duration. And there, in fact, there's several uh, review articles that have come out in the past year that showed that 
regardless of fiber source, the meta-analysis would say that increasing, you know, your total dietary fiber in your diet by to about about 20% where we were 10 years ago and gets you about half more pig because we're likely altering those farrowing dynamics. It's it's an evolving science. We don't understand quite totally how that energy is being utilized, where it's going, um, what if it's we have greater efficiencies for that energy. Um, it's still an evolving science, and that's something where you know we want to do a lot more research in that area because I think it's a tool that we can use um, to hopefully you know get more pigs, but also if we can reduce farrowing duration we're likely reducing stress on that sow. And there, I think there's a good, you know, good relationship between the stress on that sow during her f- farrowing uh, periods and her, you know, lactation performance and then her longevity in the herd. Yeah, I think you made a good point. When you said farrowing duration. I think that's, uh, that's an area where uh, a lot of research, a lot of time is, is being spent looking at, as we know, you get past that three hours, you know, the risk of stillborns, uh, just goes up. And then those pigs that are born last, you know, they're probably not as viable. They probably don't get as much colostrum. So they're invariably become your pre-weaning mortality or higher risk for pre-weaning mortality. So, it, you know, that seems to be a key key thing that we, we've got to look at as we get these, these more prolific herds and litter sizes is that how do we help that, you know, sow on her own without, you know, I think sometimes we try to uh, we can maybe cause too much problem if we get in there and try to mess mm-hmm. with her sow too much. If we can give her the tools, it sounds like this is a tool that she can have, you know, to, to maybe facilitate that process more efficiently, and then she's going to be better, uh, less stress, and it's just going to be uh, a lot of benefits there in that area. Yeah, it, I think the challenge, I think it's certainly a tool, but there's a, there's big challenges is that come with it. You know, we don't have the soluble fiber sources here in the U.S. that I think a lot of us wish, or if we do, they're um, hard to get consistently and they're often expensive. And so, um, you know, how do we, you know, we, we spend some time trying to figure out how do we make the insoluble fiber sources that we have um, elicit the same response, make them more soluble, really make them more fermentable. I think that's part of the solution. And then how do you implement it? Do you need to feed fiber all throughout gestation, certain types of fiber all throughout gestation so that she gets that response in lactation? Can you feed it just, you know, during the transition period, right before she farrows? How long does it take? I think there are a lot of unanswered questions around that. And that's part of where, you know, our our research that we can make a difference in that area is finding good strategies to implement that. And I think part of that is understanding the science more. Why does it do what it does? So then that way we can find practical strategies to implementing it. I think, you know, our industry at least seems like to me from people I've talked to is they, they believe the science, they think it's there. They understand the value. They just can't quite get to the implementation states. It doesn't even either. It doesn't pay off from an expense expense perspective or from a logistics perspective. And so how do we how do we get to the middle? How do we, you know, capitalize on something that seems to have so much value? And I wish I had more answers and questions for you today, but I think that's an area that, you know, you know, we as an industry and then researchers, we we have to we have to dial in on that a little bit more. I was talking to a mentor of mine a few weeks ago and I I, I baffled about and we've done so much fiber research the past 10, 15 years, kind of since the boom of DDGs. And I feel like we just don't understand any more than we did. We, we do, but we have more questions than ever. That's right. You know, it's a good point there. Uh, I think that the, I think that we're starting to understand all these benefits that you've mentioned that we have to sows. And I'm just going to, I'm going to play my other side, uh, my nutrition side versus now my feed mill side. You know, okay, we've got a set amount of, of soft bins here, and uh, basically, this fiber is going in a small portion of our of our tonnage. And so, how do we how do we justify you know uh, investing at, you know that that very valuable inventory that we have you know supply? How do we how can we you know make a case economically that we can put you know, this fiber source in here that it's not going to any grow finished pigs, you know, per se. And so uh, that's, I think that's the challenge is trying to, to, to quantify what are, what are all these values that you just mentioned? You know, uh, what is that worth? You know, 
And I think as, as we get into, uh, I've kind of gone through that exercise. If you take and understand the sales, you know, uh, maybe some of the, we're, we're impacting, you know, in a lifetime of sale, let's just say she wings 30 pigs. You know, we're, we're spreading that investment over and maybe what we, what we can do that sow uh, in gestation, maybe we can impact that uh, pig's health. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? How, what are some opportunities maybe, uh, I think if we look, think about that, what can we, if we use fiber in, in, in gestations, so to speak, how does that impact may possibly that pig that's, that's born and that, that efficiency of, for that pig for the rest of its life? I think there's it's it's uh it's an area where there's growing research. It's something that we've started looking at about two years ago, kind of when I started is, you know, this concept of fetal microbiome programming or can we alter the microbiome of her piglets by feeding her different strategies, more fiber producing potentially different microbial communities. You know, can we implement that into into a pig that might improve its efficiency with fiber later on? The issue there, and it, it's something that we have to kind of figure out really is, you know, there's there's a growing dogma around uh, or dichotomy around how a piglet gets its microbiome. You know, there was a time where we thought it was pretty, st- the uterus is pretty sterile. I think we've, we've moved past that. It's getting a lot of it from the vaginal vault and then, you know, from its interplay in the environment and feces. And so there's a lot of different ways in which the microbiome is imprinted into its young, but a, lot, a big chunk of it comes from its mother. And so when we think about, you know, changing the sow's microbiome to then improve it onto the young, I think fiber can have a role in that. The issue is, can we make that microbiome persist? Because microbiomes are, are um, uh, they're dynamic. They're this, they, they change based off of strep states that are available. They change based off the physiology. They change based off of environment. One sow farm is going to have a vastly different microbiome from another sow farm. And so then how do you manage that? How do you how do you get a tool that can and work in both ways? I don't know if, we, if we've if we got a good enough understanding of the science yet to get there, but I certainly think as we move forward in the future and we, we have such great sequencing technologies now that that's an area where we can continue um, to see uh, to see advan- advancements. And I think another way we can value fiber. Another aspect as it relates to fiber, you talked about kind of bin space and the logistics of it and how much do we use and is it worth bringing in this much tonnage, et cetera, is I think there's an area of opportunity, um, kind of almost if you think about it in the human nutrition realm, where you know a lot of people, because they can't eat enough fiber, they take a fiber supplement. They take a specific fiber type um, and they consume it, Metamucil or whatever fiber type, um, as a supplement. Can we provide that same logic in a reasonable cost to a sow? Can we provide tailored fiber types to a sow, um, whether it's from enzymes? I think that's one area we've done. My PhD work was really looking at mechanisms of enzymes and and carbohydrates. And that's an area I think that we can continue to hopefully get more benefit out of the fiber that's already in the diet is by providing enzymes um, that potentially break it down into some more beneficial aspects. We have a lot of growth in that area of science, finding the right enzyme with the right fiber type in the right situation at the right dosage. It's it's a lot of complexity there. But I think that that's an area we can keep growing is, you know, can we, instead of trying to provide it in complex nutrients or complex feedstuffs, can we break down some of the complex feedstuffs that we have available to us and provide a smaller portion of it? You know, almost like a feed additive. Um, but making it a part of the nutrient nutrient matrix, or can we take the nutrient matrix that's already there and shift the fiber types that are in it? Yeah, good point there. Because it, it, as I said earlier, uh, as I've been buying uh, commodities over the years and byproducts, and uh, you know, used to uh, the percentage uh, if I value that byproduct versus corn, I'm paying much uh, much more expensive today. And our, our, our sources are limited. You know, we're limited to, you know, near a feed, uh, uh, an ethanol plant or a, uh, a flour mill. And so we've got limited resources as fiber. And uh, we know it's got benefits that we can capture. And uh, so you led on to some of the, what are some of the strategies, uh, as you, you were talking about enzymes, how do those, uh, some of the strategies that we can use maybe to get more and to get some value out of that uh uh, add some value to that uh, byproduct, that fiber source, 
and make it more economical to use. Yeah. yeah. So there are several, I think, strategies. I think the the top one that's um, been more studied, and it, it's it's we still got ways to go. Is is enzyme technologies? You know, providing carbohydrates that break down that fiber type into smaller polysaccharides, into oligosaccharides, and into monosaccharides, different smaller fibrous components that then can be utilized by the animal either for calorie, for an energy um, source, or to have a beneficial effect on the microbiome. One of the interesting things that's come out about enzymes, um, a lot of my PhD work looked at that, and we've um, looked at it even more so here recently, is this concept of stimbiotics this concept of stimulating the microbiome to ferment more fiber. Can we provide an enzyme or enzymes with other fibrous components? Um, or, you know, I think there's lots of technologies that might follow in the symbiotic realm that ferment, make the microbiome greater to ferment fiber. So if, you know, symbiotics have been defined as a, um, a compound that improves the fermentation of fiber beyond what the compound can provide itself. And so we take an enzyme, xylanase is one I've worked a lot with, is it breaks down arabinoxylan, which is the primary fiber type found in a lot of corn sources, um, down into smaller polysaccharide and oligosaccharide fractions. These oligosaccharide fractions then are fermented by the microbiome. It then encourages other microbiomes or other microbes that ferment fiber to be more prevalent. And so not only are we getting breakdown of the substrate by the enzyme itself, we're now programming a microbiome to say, hey, we have this substrate available. Let's ferment more of it. Let's, you know, let's proliferate and get more out of this substrate that's available. And so it increases fiber digestibility beyond the capacity of what that enzyme could do itself. Um, I think it's really valuable because it's, it's turning more insoluble fiber, as you could say, into fermentable fiber. Not necessarily soluble. Some of it is. But it makes it a more fermentable fiber type. And when we get fermentation out of that fiber, we get more of those beneficial health effects that are associated with it. You know, we've, we've done some of the mechanistic work around that related to xylanases reduction in finishing pig mortality. And that was a trait that a lot of production systems had saw, but maybe they didn't see an improvement in feed efficiency. And we think it's partially because of the interplay between the prebiotic and symbiotic-like effects. We also know that um, that's, that can be translated to the sow. And in fact, because the sow, as she moves into later gestation, um, that symbiotic effect becomes even more prevalent because of her ability to digest fiber gets greater. And so the symbiotic effect really even helps um, with that. And so I think that's a strategy um, that certainly, um, I think, helps with producers now. But it's a strategy we got to continue to fine tune because, as you know, DDGs is not DDGs is not DDGs. Fiber type fiber sources that we're commonly using are constantly changing. And so the way the enzymes interact with those fiber sources are also changing. And so, you know, how do we how do we apply that? How do we get that more precise? How do we um, get more dynamic in how we feed those things? And then also, how do we do that in the logistics constraint of a gestation sow? You no, know, she's pretty much getting the, everyone's getting the same diet. So then we, we don't have as maybe as much tailoring as we would hope, but I think there's an area, you know, maybe not today, but five, 10 years from now, we're getting more precision feeding. We're getting more group housing with precision feeding stalls that, that we can implement strategies to help hopefully improve that fiber digestibility. Yeah, that's, that's an inter interesting uh, approach. You know, we're just, we're, 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 we're laced, faced with what we have, you know, basically the, the sources, as you said, you know, these, these, uh, there's more and more ethanol plants to get more and more starch out. So these products, these byproducts we have are uh, predominantly going to increase their fiber content. And uh, so it's, it's and, you know, just on a sustainable, when we've got, look at uh, animal production, you know, we, we, we've got the dregs of some of the food, human food production. And uh, if we can take and utilize those products better, then we're, we're, we're doing, you know, uh, an environmentally uh, good thing as well. Not, not to mention, you know, we're, we're improving the, 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 the welfare for our animals and, and all these other benefits. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's got a more uh, a global, a more, you know, uh, impact too, when you look at how we're going to feed the world and how we're going to be, you know, more efficient with our resources and, and uh, producing a, you know, a pound of protein. So, very, 
Yeah, I think it it, it can definitely have an impact on that um, carbon utilization, even nitrogen utilization as it relates to feedstuffs. I think enzymes have an important role there. Proteases combined with carbohydrates to help improve the amount of um, carbon and nitrogen that is becoming, you know, becoming a animal product versus ending up into the environment. I think that's an area, you know, as we become more environmentally conscious, as we think about sustainability in our systems, it's it's something we have to give it credit and value for it and think about how we continue um, um, to get that to get that out of there. And, you know, I wanted to make one comment. We've talked a lot about the beneficial aspects of fiber, and I certainly believe those. I certainly think there's a way that we can um, uh, utif- utilize it to capitalize on those benefits, and it's a continuing growing science around that. But we have to keep in the back of our mind that there are anti-nutritive effects that are associated with it. You know, it's not... It's not a silver bullet by any means. It's a it's a tool, or it's a way that we can, you know, potentially um, utilize ingredients differently. Uh, but it certainly can reduce fiber digestibility, or excuse me, nutrient digestibility. Um, you know, some fibrous components we have to think about mycotoxins because there are certain, you know, if you get some fibrous components, you might get more mycotoxins with them. And so we have to think about the diff, you know, some of those negative effects. They're still there. We're still managing those, um, but it's it's balancing. How do we manage those negative effects, or um, you know, help alleviate some of them, and then capitalize on the beneficial effects? And to me, um, you know, enzymes and um, you know, particle size processing is another one. Um, I think technologies that can help us balance that dichotomy is a way as we move forward into the future to get more calories out of fiber and to capitalize on its beneficial effects. You know, is uh, how close do you think we are of, of actually being able to quantify the value of fiber? So w- we actually look at it, you know, when a nutritionist starts to formulate and say, well, I, you know, maybe I, what is the net value for this? If I can, if I can take all these values and somehow put a, a number to it, uh, you know, I think we're there in some instances. I think there's ways to look at it from a feed cost perspective that we can we can value when when fiber is cheaper, you know, or we can get fibrous ingredients. You know, it's it's valuing different KPIs differently or looking at more KPIs. I think that was you know the feed efficiency versus mortality story around xylanase that happened, you know, over the past eight years or so. I think was a, a powerful one. If we just look at feed efficiency measures in corn-based diets with xylanase, it wasn't as effective as we all hoped it would be. But when you take into account the mortality aspects, the amount of full or the amount of full value market hogs that are getting there, you know that played up on a cost of um, and a cost of implementing. You know when you value that into your equation, the cost of implementing an enzyme um, really paid for itself. For the cell, that's a lot harder to do. For f- implementing fiber during the transition period, that's harder to do. And we know with cell research, it's harder to quantify. I can't do that in 20 animals. I got to do that in 200 animals. And so I think it's a growing science. And I don't have a good answer for you to say, this is how you value fiber today. I think there are beneficial effects that we can see from across the production system, across the lifetime of that sow. But it's not an easy thing to value immediately. When you think about it, it's not something you can just go value for a turn of pigs and look at it relative to other closeout data. It's something you might have to value over several parodies. You're going to have to value maybe different production systems. And then you've got to tweak it as fiber sources change. So it, it's there's so much complexity there that I hope in five years from now, Jerry, I have a much better answer for you <laughs> and we've got better Thank grasp you. on that. Um, but I think it's a part of the future and it's I think it's a part of thinking about the sow from a holistic perspective in her health and in her longevity um, that we can use it as a tool to, to help with that. Yeah. You know, it's uh, in, in my personal experience uh, it and the research, the data would support, it takes a couple cycles, you know, when you're feeding fiber, we really don't see it on. So you got to invest, you know, you actually got to invest uh, more than just putting it in, you know, and, and what you're going to see in that subsequent Leonard, but uh, so you got a little bit of investment there, and uh, understanding that as part of it uh, is important. So, yeah, very good. I think uh, it's, uh, I think there's more, as you said, there's more for, there's way more than uh, for us to learn than we know. So, uh, 
I'm excited. I, I, you're doing some great work. I think this is uh, this is something that's uh, very, uh, you know, uh, important for our times. Is, is we're trying to to feed costs. You know, we've got these these sources that maybe if we can utilize them better, if we use enzymes technologies, we get more out of them. Reduce our feed costs. Uh, it helps all of us, and, and and you know we reduce some of these. Uh, now we've got more of these, you know, human uh, grains and what have you. That that now we we don't we can utilize some of these byproducts better, and and actually improve our animals' health. Uh, so it's it's mm-hmm. a win win, you know, and and very very different uh, animal welfare. A lot of different areas. It's, it's a win win. So I'm encouraged. Well, I guess we're we're getting close to the end, and uh, we got to you and I could talk about this probably for for days. Yes. Don't you? <laughs> it's time for our famous three. Feed flow is changing the way the swine industry sees feed. As the world's only on-pipe feed sensor, FeedFlow tells you exactly how much feed is being delivered to your animals, so you can be sure that every pig in your barn is well-fed and growing. With industry-leading precision and up-to-the-minute real-time data and alerts, FeedFlow is a simple and affordable way to improve production outcomes across your organization. Feed is too expensive to ignore. Try FeedFlow today. But uh, we got three questions uh, we always ask at the end. And uh, first one, what is your favorite resource? Look, uh, maybe not even about uh, animals or pigs. Oh, gosh. Um, Well, my favorite pig resource, um, partially just because of what I do in relationship to fiber, is the value of fiber, engaging the second brain for fiber nutrition. Um, It was a book put out a few years ago, and it has such good um, information. perspectives related to fiber. Lots of different scientists contributed to that book. And um, it has a multitude of different resources as it relates to fiber. Um, you know, I I think and in terms of um, quick resources, I'm, I'm becoming more and more a fan of LinkedIn because there's a lot of things. I find so many paper people, you know, push papers on LinkedIn that I I don't have didn't get on Google Scholar or I don't have I haven't had time to look at that specific thing. But then I go and read that paper and it's like, wow, this relates to X, Y, and Z. And so, um, you know, I've been trying to get more engaged in those types of platforms because I think they have they have value. So I think those are more my swine um, uh, resources. I do. I read a lot of personal development books. Uh, my favorite one I've read three times now because I keep going back to it is Deep Work by Cal Newport. Um, it's a book about trying to starve your distractions and feed your focus and how, you know, allowing yourself time to really get into deep work um, can help um, uh, progress your productivity. Um, and, you know, I a long time in my, you know, in my grad school days and even short my career, I feel like I was multitasking a lot. And multitasking really just diminished my productivity. And so I think, you know, being able to develop skills around hyper focusing and then hi- focusing on the things that have greater payoff um, has been, you know, that book has really helped with that. And so um, I, I plug that book any chance I get because I think it's transformed the way I value time. Very good. I'm definitely going to get uh, get, a, get a copy of those books. Uh, and, and sounds like some good reads there. How about... Uh, the person uh, or persons that were big influencers in your career? Oh gosh, I have a lot. I would say the person probably influenced my career the most um, was John Patience doing my PhD with him. I think more so than anything, um, and I think you'd ask any of us alumni in that situation, John, um, you know, he gave us license to really be, uh, to develop into leaders and to develop soft skills and to learn a variety of things outside of science, but also uh, really hone in our scientific understanding of things related to nutrition and, you know, how that does that apply on a day-to-day basis in a farm uh, and in swine production. And those are um, values that I hold so dearly, his mentorship, the way he mentored students, I think was really, really valuable to me. He tailored his mentorships to each of us. And, you know, as a mentor, you learn your mentorship styles. I mentor students now and so I think about, you know, the good things that I've, how I was mentored, but then how do I become my own mentor? How do I mentor students that are in different stages of life than I am, had different backgrounds? And so 
Um, you know, I think uh, uh, John was super, super beneficial in that. I had a really good committee, PhD committee that were uh, full of mentors. Um, George Fahey, when it comes to fiber, um, I talked to Dean Boyd, he was on my committee quite a bit as it relates to production things. And so, you know, some of the giants in our industry, I was very fortunate to get to learn from, and I still get to pick up the phone and call and say, what do you think about this? And, um, you know, that that's been super beneficial to me. Um, you know, I'm building new mentors too, you know, as a young mentor in science, trying to think, you know, um, you know, those that are also in kind of my cohort, I think we've, you know, developed some peer mentors in that sense too. So uh, I would say those are probably my biggest mentors. Awesome. That's, some, that's you listen, some very good uh, heavy hitters in our industry, as I said earlier. And uh, it's amazing how that impact, you know, you, you think you're impacting that one student, but then that student goes on and impacts. And, and so it just exponentially, you know, that impact uh, can really go and, and expand and, and uh, reach a lot of different people. That's awesome. Uh, last, uh, what you know, what is a uh, you think are some traits of people? I'll say in research, you're, you're a researcher. What are, what are some uh, traits uh, or characteristics that make for a successful researcher? There's a lot of different ways you can look at what makes a successful researcher. Is it there's metrics for that? Um, there's you know. Um, awards and those types of things. But to me, all of the great researchers I've ever been around or have had the opportunity to learn from, or right now I'm in a department um, that's full of great researchers, high hitters in their industry. I, I'm amazed at the amount of people here at Mizzou who are at the top of their game when it comes to research. And all of them in their own way have impact. To me, great researchers have great impact. And that impact can look differently. You know, our group does probably more basic research than others, but that has huge impact as it relates to improving applied solutions, developing science, developing technologies, um, understanding physiology so we can create um, different technologies. And so, you know, my in, our impact, we want to be impactful scientists that um, does basic science so that we can innovate or support or develop applied solutions. And so to me, the best researchers, they have impact. And how we measure that impact, I think, depends on what our goals are at the end of day, at the end of the day. And the ones I've been around and you know, a lot of the researchers in our industry, it's having impact on the swine industry and how we produce swine and how we support our industry. Very good. And I have to say, you know, the work you're doing, I think, is going to be very impactful. And so uh I congratulate your lab, you, you, what the work you're doing, and and uh, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to move. As you said, you know, we, we all learn little pieces, and we, we learn things, and we move the, we're just moving the can forward, and, and eventually we're going to learn more and more, and, and that just being innovative and, and, and finding answers. But we'll never find it, you know, we'll never get to the end where we know it all. But uh, I look forward, I, like I said, I congratulate your work, and I think it's uh, – Personally, like I said, you're preaching to the choir. I'm, I've been able to, in, you know, use some of these fiber and see some of the benefits you're talking about in in, in the field, and see sows, you know, that are they're much happier. You know, they're 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 animal. You can you can see that they're much happier once they've had, you know, with high fiber in their diet. So, uh, it, I think it's going to be a, it's going to work, and I look forward to having maybe we can have you back, you know, years years to come, and uh, we'll learn even more. But I, I know I've learned a lot today, so. Uh, I appreciate you coming to our and uh, being on our podcast. Well, thanks, Jerry, for having me, and I'll, I'll be glad to come back anytime. All right. Sounds good.